I was looking for a studio because I had just finished teaching at Howard and this place grew out of the idea of me teaching three years at Howard in a in a hundred percent black way. It was just phenomenal. Uh, and I'm from New Mexico, went to UCLA, Arizona State for undergrad. So, you know, I was not around too many black people. So to go into a place that was drenched with blackness was really uh, unusually good for me. And the thing that I saw that was unique there is they were in one place for a long time and they did the fight day by day there. So that's what I came back. I says, I'm, whatever place I choose, I'm gonna try to stay in that place and then deal with the problems as they come and see how we as media people can assess that, you know, so we can incubate that, think that out instead of being purely reactive because this industry has forced us to go hand to mouth kind of existence. And you really aren't able to kind of assess direct and see where we really are. And sometimes you fumble the ball because of the just super need, you know, and not knowing that in the future it's going to be worth a whole lot more, but that immediate need makes you do strange things. And so that's kind of what the Hollywood feeds off. So anyway, so we started this place that way uh, where he told me to go ahead and stay here because I was thinking, I couldn't be in the same place that I did, did internships with because I I'd internship with Brockman Gallery and I worked there. And at the time, uh, we, we thought strangely. We thought there could only be one in every community instead of like, like to have two galleries. Aren't we fighting against each other? You know, and then you had to look. Isn't there such thing as a artistic row of galleries, artist, you know, button galleries, Chinese food, all together. But we haven't ever done business together, so we didn't even know that that's part of it. And so Charles broke me out of that habit is all I was leading to. <laughs> is he's like, come on, Ben, just buy this place, so, you know, rent this place over here so we could see what was happening. So anyway, I thought I would talk to you about the, and then I just want to say one other thing about the name. We grew the name out of uh, when the Russian Empire uh, fell. Uh, uh, Lori, uh, uh, what, my wife at the time, we went to to a uh, economic uh, conference that uh, AFI was having, and it was doing all the different economic theories around the world, and one of them was the chaos theory, and it kind of pricked our interest because we didn't know such thing as economics and chaos. So, so but really what, what we found after you do deep research with it is the ancient word for chaos means where brilliant dreams are born. So we chose that name. So it is, it's the opposite of westernization. You know, it's because you see everything, not just dot or dip. You know, Western world has won because of the dot or dip but they don't see any of the gray area or, this, or the spectrum of life. And so uh, that's how this place grew. It's called chaos, not to be dis, di, disorganized, it's to be super organized by seeing everything. Cool, thanks for that intro, Ben. Um, welcome everyone to the LA Rebellion panel. Um, this is the Juneteenth Film Festival, the first ever, so give yourselves a hand for coming out. And we just watched Killer of Sheep, and while it's fresh, I'd like to introduce Charles Burnett, the director, the filmmaker behind this masterpiece. Um, right out the gate, I would just like to know what you set out to do with this film, and how much of you is really embedded in these characters, in these scenarios. How much of this movie comes from your daily life? I would, I'd like to thank you very much for coming. Um, this film was a student film, it was my thesis film at UCLA, and uh, at the time it was a bunch of students, it was like Ben, Heidi Garima, uh, Sharon Larkin, a bunch of people, I can't remember all the names now, but we were, uh, we were a, a minority group of filmmakers that are trying to find what is a black film, or a Chicano film, or an Asian film, whatever, you know, and, and so we, um, were trying to do something different than, than Hollywood, you know, in a sense that 
you know, the, the, the sort of stereotypical images, and we were looking for our own voice and things like that. And this is a result of trying to, to do a film about my community and also involve the, the kids in my community to show them how to make film and to, to demystify it in a way. Uh, because if you can turn a hi-fi on, you can certainly do sound and anything else, you know. And so that was the idea because, you know, usually sometimes when Hollywood comes to the community, um, it's just sort of like standoffish elitism, elitism you know, where, uh, for example, uh, not to jump around, I mean, there was a film shooting, um, you know, over on La Cienega or whatever. And uh, I went over and I was sort of curious. I asked one of the crew members what... Uh, what is the film about? And he acted like I wouldn't know. He sort of was like sort of brushed me off and said, "Oh, it's a film, you know." And 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 so I just, you know, it, it, it was it was sort of a typical response, you know. And and so I wanted to bring filmmaking to the community and to my neighborhood. And the the people you see in the film are mostly friends of mine, except for one or two that I didn't know that I, I you know, I. Uh, found uh, this studio that had like Casey Moore and one or two other actors, but all the rest of them were my neighbors I worked on, that worked on an earlier film that I did. And uh, so it was, it, was, it was an attempt to try to show, like this is how people in my neighborhood live, you know? And it wasn't, uh, uh, was supposed to be, um, you know, a, a, a present like this is what the total black experience is, it's just, in my neighborhood, it was people that I knew. So what I wanted to do was to uh, to reflect, you know, not my not my opinion, so to speak. You know, like ABC, like if you do A, B, C, and then this would happen. But I wanted to sort of sort of like look at it, like how would um, uh, you tell a story that we didn't did, you didn't impose your values on it, but but pick certain things that sort of represented. Uh, represent who they are, and, and, and everything in it actually happened, and it, well, I mean, it didn't actually happen, but it was things I've seen and witnessed, so I wanted to put it in and make a narrative out of it. And uh, so I felt that um, it would be uh, not a representation of all black people, but just the people in my neighborhood. Uh, because I remember, uh, I used to be a great fan of, Rob, uh, of, of um, Paul Robeson, and I used to go to this barbershop, and, uh, Watts on, a, on, on Central Avenue, and it's this oak. It's a, it was a bunch of older barbers, and you know they, they were like in their 70s or something like that. And I used to go there, you know, whenever I needed a haircut. And it was always it would always be this sort of forum. A bunch of people from the community or the barbershop would always be arguing about politics or whatever it is, you know. And and so it was this particular day when um, it was a, a, a Paul Robeson's birthday. And, and I was, you know, a fan of his and things like that. And so uh, I, brought up this, I brought up the subject of Paul Robinson, you know, what a great man he was and so forth like that. And like, this is Watts, right? And so these barbers were kind of like, well, uh, I admire Paul Robinson as, as an artist, but not as a person because he talked against America, you know? And, and I'm thinking these guys were ripe for, uh, uh, revolution or something like that, but no, that was very conservative, you know? And so we got this big argument, and, and, and so finally one of them said, look, um, I'll give you a ticket to Russia if you promise not to come back, you know? And so, but then I sort of realized from that and some other experience that uh, I couldn't speak for the black community, you know? At that particular time, most of us thought, well, we were so sort of like, uh, what we were doing, we were speaking for the black community. And you realize that you don't, you only speak for yourself. And so when I realized that, I tried to make this movie in, 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 in that sense, you know, that only thing I can do is pick out things that actually happen and put it together in a narrative and, uh, and present it like this is how people live in my community. And so that's how that came about. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, because when we were setting up the festival, me and Ben were watching clips and we're watching the scene where they put the motor in the, in the truck. And Ben was like, that feels like yesterday. Um, and I'm just wondering how uh, recent does this feel? Does it, is it still very vivid? Are there specific memories that stand out? Certain people you met, certain interactions you had while filming, since it was so much just in the community. 
Is there anything that stands out as far as a moment that like encapsulates the making of process? Um, well, the movie was made, I guess, what in in, in, in 1970 something. I can't remember the exact date, you know, but it was it was early in that at that time, and I haven't seen the film that much, you know. After you've worked on it for a number for a period of time, and you see it over and over again in the editing room, and it, it's it's hard to look at it again, you know, because it's like God. And then and then you see all the mistakes you made, and it magnifies everything, you know. See, so it's it, it, some things is kind of painful. And, and the other thing, like the, the, the main actress, Casey Moore, who played in Julie Dash's film and Billy Woodbury's film, she died recently, you know, and several other people in there passed on. So it, it, it's kind of, in one way it's nostalgic, and another, another, another way it's kind of painful looking at, you know, people who you used to know and they passed on. But uh, what, what, what the motor scene was, uh, you know, I used to drive an old car and was always breaking down and things like that, you know. And and uh, and I remember, um, for example, the, the the sort of absurdity of a lot of things that were happening. Um, like um, I had this '53 Ch Chevrolet, and the uh, the generator went out on it, and so I had to, to take out the generator and and walk. Uh, a mile and a half to a generator repair shop, you know, and then an exchange shop. And, and uh, so I go into the shop, and the guy, I tell him I need to get another generator. I used one. He says, put it on the counter and go out in the back and, and find one that you think it fits your car. And so there's this big pile of g -g generators in the pile that I had to pick from. And you would think that they would be working because he tells you to go back and get one. So I, I, I go back and I, I pick out one, and I go all the way back a mile and a half back to my house, put it on, you know, and then try to start, it doesn't work. So I take it back to the generator shop, you know, and the guy says, uh, put it there and, and, and go back and, and find one in that in pile. And I go back and look at it around, and I see my old generator there. And it's, and it's, it's only been like a half an hour or something, whatever it is, you know, and so, I, you know, and so it's this really absurd thing that happens, you know. And in terms of uh, my friends, like they were, like uh, they had uh, their generator gone out, uh, and it burned out the battery, you know. And it, and and if you don't fix what's going on electrically, it keeps burning out the battery. So every night they would steal another battery, you know. And instead of fixing what was wrong with it, they would go out. Somewhere. And then one day I was walking through the alley and. And there was this guy with his hand in his pocket, and, and someone had stole his battery, you know. And he was looking over the, over the fence, he looked at me and said, I wish I could catch whoever it was and shoot him, you know, whatever it is, you know. And so you try to tell your friends, you know, hey, you know, you guys have to fix this thing and I keep going and taking batteries every night because that's very dangerous, you know. And so it was, it was things like that that you were trying to comment on, you know, the absurdity. But that was the only way people, not the only way, but we don't have any money. You, you, you know, there's few choices and a lot of them are pretty bad. And, and, and so that was, you know, in, in case of the motor, uh, I went over to my friend's house and uh, he had uh, uh, this motor. And I mean, not the motor, but uh, yeah, the motor in the front end of his car in his house, you know. And it was this guy laying on the, on the floor, which you see, you know, in the movie. And he had got hit in the head with a, a tire iron because he had tried to stop the neighbors from, from making too much noise. He had to go to work one morning, so he's, he, he went next door and, and, and so would you mind turning on the music and, and somebody got mad and they hit him in the head with a tire iron, you know. And, uh, and, 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 and so anyway, I mean, a lot of crazy things you try to make sense out of, you know. And, and that was the idea of a lot of those things you see in the movie. Now, they seem like exaggerations, but they are to a certain extent. But basically, it was, it was uh, taken from actual events. Anyway. I'm curious on what goes through your head when you finish this film, but you kind of have to sit on it for some time. It takes a little bit for it to come out, correct? Because the 16 millimeter print is damaged and the soundtrack has issues with clearing songs and things of that nature. Um, I'm wondering on what like a delayed release does to you and also, am I, am I off in that? Um, 
Somewhat. I mean, well, it was a student film, so you know, you, you didn't have to pay for music and things like that if it wasn't going to show theatrically. And so I didn't bother with getting the rights to the music because, you know, if your film wasn't, you know, um, it was only going to be shown on the weekends at different, you know, in, in, in the community. And, uh, and, and, and so I didn't really worry about that. And, um, and so I got a lot of music, like 78 musics that my mother used to play and things like that. So I put them in the film. Uh, and it was actually like to preserve those f pieces of music. And uh, so, um, and, and, and so it wasn't going to be shown theatrical. I had these legal problems to deal with. And so after I finished the film, it just sat there. And you know, we toured the film with Pearl Bowles and Oliver F Franklin. Uh, they went around the, the different communities around the states. And, and that was the, the, where it really got you know, screened at and things like that. And uh, so it wasn't until um, Milestone, many years later, wanted to distribute the film. And they're great, they're a great, great, great bunch of people, milestone people. And I really give them credit because they had to work really hard to try to get the rights. And, and at that particular point, it's very difficult to get the rights to the music because you know now it's like everyone wants money for everything and a lot of money for the, and particularly for music rights, for even for a touchdown. And it was some pieces that we didn't get, but milestone really worked hard and got just about all the pieces except for one that was a Dinah Washington piece, you know. But other than that, uh, and so it took him years to. I'm, I'm laughing, but I shouldn't, but um, because he really worked hard, but it took him a long time and had to, to get the grants and things to get the, enough money to, to, to pay for the, those different pieces of music. I must have about 10 pieces of music in there, you know, and they were all very expensive. They become more expensive when, you, when they know they have you and the, features, and the, the pieces are married to the film, you know. And so... Um, and so it took it took them a number of years to do to get the music rights. You know, it's it's right now it's almost impossible to make a film. You know, with, like we did before, like you know, to to just go and steal shots. You might say, you know, and just you know, shoot on the railroad tracks and things like that. My son is, is went to Loyola Film School, and and they they had to get the permits uh, and show the schools that they they got permits to go to certain places, like shooting the train tracks. If you don't, they will suspend you. Where when we were at UCLA, hey, the world was free, you know, and we just do whatever we want to, you know. Not, well, mostly, you know. And uh, we didn't have to worry about all these permits. Now it's costly, it's, it's really costly, it's really costly to do a film, an independent film. Mm. And I'm also curious, because um, I mean, I'm born in 94, so I'm so far separated. Yeah, from this legacy. Um, what was the reception in the States compared to Europe? Is it similar to that of jazz artists, where they get more popular overseas and people catch on later here? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, here, it didn't get very much, just little private screens here and there, like in churches and, and community centers and so forth. And uh, where, where it wasn't a very good uh, uh, projectionist and things like that, I remember one particular case where they, they couldn't turn off the lights in the room and things like that, this big auditorium. And so they decided, well, we we'll unscrew the light bulbs, you know, and things like that to, to, to cut out the lights. And it was things like that that really made it difficult. But, but, but people, you know, really commented that they liked it, you know, and things like that, and, and, and reminded them of their lives and things like that. But, but in Europe, I mean, we screened our films there to, like there were these people like Art Hesselink of the, uh, Amsterdam and, and Paris of the FNAC with Catherine Well and people like that and Germany, the same thing. When my film was shown in Germany, I just, you know, screened it there, I didn't expect anything. And it was, it was at the Young People's Forum at the Berlin Film Festival. And, um, and so it, it won a prize at the Berlin Film Festival, which I was quite surprised. And, uh, and it was written all over in the, in, 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 the, in the press and everything. And same way when we were in Paris, we were showing our films. And, and, and they looked at it very seriously. Here in the States, nothing. You know, when I won the prize at Berlin, it was a major thing in Europe, you know. And the same thing with, um, um, uh, I can't think of his name at the moment. He did Ganja and Hess. Uh, uh, so then, you know, the guy who did Gunge and his, yeah, Bill Gunn. And we were all together at, at one point and in Europe. 
And he was telling me when he screened Ganja and Hesse, it was a phenomenal thing that happened in Europe, in Paris. And they followed him to the airport, you know, and it was in the, all in the press there. When he got to the States, nothing. He was, no one was at the airport meeting him, you know. The same thing happened here when I went to in Berlin and won a prize. It was all in the papers there and so forth, so like, like, you know, the critics. And, um, and when I got to the, back to the States, it was nothing. The only thing they mentioned was that the food on the German, on the, on the main boulevard in Germany, you know, things like that. And uh, it was silent, you know, and, and, and so we got a lot of support and, and, and motivation from European scholars and film festival people and things like that who wrote about us all the time. And they, they put on these special festivals of black independent films that didn't exist here. You know, it was there, and you mentioned jazz, what it felt like. It was the same sort of felt, you know, you felt that, you know, like the jazz players, you talk about, you know, the, the Renaissance and things like that, and, and, and jazz and music and how that, you know, they had to go to Europe to be respected and looked at, and, 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 and looked at their work as art, you know. And they, same thing with the blues and things like that. When we were in, in France, they had this whole thing on blues, you know, and featured in the, in, in Paris, in the city. And, and here, you come back, and they're like still living in these shotgun houses, you know, and, and, and things like that. And so you find that there's a big discrepancy between here and there, between, between Europe and the United States. And you feel a different person when you go there and come back here. You know, same thing in Africa, you know, it's just amazing. You, you really understand racism, and when you make this contrast. Got it. Um, Want to switch gears really quick and talk about education. Um, you go to LACC for to be an electrician, is that true? Yeah. Uh, what makes you switch gears to be a creative? Oh, thank you. Well, you know, well, I went to Fremont High. I don't know if you went to... Anyway, it's, you know, it's over the night, uh, 77th in San Pedro, whatever it is, you know. and. Uh, and I didn't know what I was going to be. I thought I was going to be drafted. You know, I was waiting to be drafted. And uh, so, um, uh, you know, they just, just shove you in these classes, you know, like a vocational class, you know. And, and so that's what happened. I got, went there, and then they put me in a, a vocational class in electronics, which was very good, actually. I learned a lot in there. Uh, I had some great teachers. Um, but I, I wasn't a very good student, you know. I was hanging out with these characters in my neighborhood, you know, and, <laughs> and uh, you, know, I, you know, I wanted to be a boxer when I was, you know. Uh, and, but, but, but anyway, I'm glad I didn't because a friend of mine, we were, we were thinking about it, and his name was Thurman Durden. He was a really great boxer, you know, and he, and he was, I think, a lot better than Sugar Ray L L Leonard. And he was a left-handed boxer, so he didn't get a lot of fights because they didn't like to fight him left-handed because they were a difficult match. Anyway, so uh, so he went. He became a boxer, and uh, I remember looking at him. We both were about the same size, and uh, I diverted in a minute. But anyway, so you know, a boxer starts getting his hands start growing like this. You know, you know, like like. Big, you know, and 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 um, so anyway, uh, uh, I sort of stayed in school, and I also handled these pool players. And I want to be a pool player at one point too. And then, um, but I, but I, I was going to school, so most of the guys that didn't go to school became really good pool players. And so I realized that if if I wanted to be a pool player, I had to stay out of school. I had to, I had to skip school, you know, and stay at the corner pool hall. And then, so I made a decision, no, I can't be doing that. You know? So I went on to school, and, uh, and I wasn't very much in literature or anything like that. But then I used to raise pigeons, you know. And I used to read all these pigeon magazines, you know, and surprisingly that's... Anyway, so I think that's how I kind of like took up reading and things, about reading about these pigeon magazines. I used to sell off with these pigeons that cost uh, like couple hundred dollars a pair, you know, because they were tumblers, you know, rollers. Have any of you raised pigeons here? None of you? Ah, uh, you, you missed out on life. <laughs> because you sit up there, I used to throw them up and just sit there and watch these pigeons fly all day long, you know. And instead of studying, I realized, man, I should have been 
you know, reading and doing this sort of thing, except for Pigeon magazines. Anyway, so uh, I uh, took this electronic class, and I was my I was waiting, to, the, the war broke out in the Vietnam War, and I was waiting to, to be drafted, because everyone in my neighborhood was just, just taken, you know. And uh, anyway, so uh, uh, I was, I, I finished my major in electronics, and uh, it was very helpful because it taught you how to write in a certain way, you know, studying electronics and, and doing these formulas and, 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 and understanding uh, what it was about. And, and trying to describe it in these, you know, and, 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 and just commenting on the, the, what was going on. Anyway, so you, you had to be very concrete about it. Anyway, so that, and so when I got disenchanted with electronics, you know, I, I was interested in, in photography. And so, uh, I didn't take it, but when I, I kept going to movies because I had a job at the library and I was watching these movies when I was off w going to work and I had these, this time to spend waiting wait until my job started at the downtown library. And so I'd go to the, to, the, to the LA theater downtown on 6th Street and Broadway and watch movies before I go, into, to go to work. And so I got interested in the camera work, the cinematography. And so I called around to find out how do you, you know, what do you do? And SC uh, was a school in UCLA. I wanted to go to SC because it was closer. However, when I went there to enroll, they, they said, oh yeah, you, you can come, you know. They, but you have to pay whatever it was like, something like $30 a unit or something like that. And that was really, like really it's been outrageous in a way. And so I said, well, I want to, you know, take out a loan out. Yeah. Okay, but you, uh, but you have to, to be in school in order to apply for a loan. But in order to be in school, you have to pay the, the initial tuition, which is you know, beyond my means. And so, um, and, and so even trying to go to the bank and borrow money, you had to have, you know, show you had credit, you know, and that means, and I thought that, that I paid all my bills, so I should have, have great, good, good credit. But no, you have to have bills in order to have good credit. And I, I, I couldn't understand. We were arguing about it. I said, but I don't, I don't own anybody, so it'd be, e it'd be easy to pay you back. No, you have to have credit, you know, uh, you know, show that you can pay bills. Anyway, so I called up UCLA, and they were like, yeah. You know, you know, it was like kind of a hippie kind of experience at the time. You know, and I said, yeah, c come on over. And that was the best thing to happen, you know. Anyway, so, so but oh, but when I was at City College, I also took this really wonderful writer by the name of Isabel Ziegler. And, 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 and then I got interested in the literature. And she was really great, because she was one of the most inspiring teachers I ever had. You know, we had a teacher at, at Fremont who was, who was very good, but they fired him, you know, because he used to come with alcohol on his breath, whatever it is, at, I mean, at uh, Fremont. Anyways, but, and I was just about getting interested in literature when, when they fired him. And so anyway, so, um, so anyway, I, I, I got interested in literature through Isabel Ziegler, great teacher. You know, I wish I had her when I was in all, all throughout through my high school and, and elementary education. I would have been a little better off, let me put it that way. You know. Anyway, so that's how I got started with, with uh, filmmaking, it was through her classes and literature and things like that. And, and I knew that um, what I wanted to do, I didn't want to do these simple movies on this, you know, this meaningless movies that Hollywood was making, you know, because it didn't apply to me. I didn't understand what was going on. And, you know, I came from a situation where it was during the Civil Rights Movement, the Panthers and stuff like that, then we were supposed to be responsible. We were supposed to have to do something that was meaningful, you know. And, and, and so I remember, um, if I'm talking too much, just let me know. Uh, I, I remember um, being in this film class, directing class, and they had a UCLA these uh, soap operas, you know, that we had to direct, you know, and I couldn't understand why this meaningless stuff they wanted us to spend time on, you know, and um, and that was a good lesson because I, this, this uh, teacher, uh, Delia Salve, was, you know, because I didn't have no interest in doing a, 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 um, a uh, soap opera, you know, because it was like, you know, how People die, they come back, and, they, and some other, you know, didn't make any sense. And so I just 
forget about it. I didn't do it, you know. But I've seen people who did it well. I mean, they weren't interested in like moral conflicts and things like that, which I was involved in, you know, interested in. And, and I see that you, you, you don't have to have deep meaning to make it work, you know. And, and, and so I, that was a good lesson. But anyway, um, but it was great being at UCLA at the time. And I learned a lot because we worked in everyone's film, you know. That was one of the good things about film school. And pity that you said you had to work on someone's film. You know, you had the crew on their film. And so you learn different, different job, you know, uh, like sound, camera, and all that stuff like that, you know. So it gave you a great experience. So I really enjoyed that. I got a question for the both of you. Um, what is your perception of UCLA before you go in? Because 1969, a lot happens. I mean, Angela Davis is fired. Um, Bunchy Carter is killed on campus. Um, I'm wondering, this all happens before you all get there, correct? No. The, you, you were there during. I'm really curious about what's going through your heads um, during this tumultuous time. Well, he was there. You should hear his. But for me, uh, I was running. I ran a place called the Black Cultural Center, the Black House at Arizona State. And so we got NOMO, which was their newspaper from UCLA. So I got, you know, uh, uh, we were, for us, to me, NOMO was Grand Central Station for all of the black art, uh, all the black cultural centers around the country because it was well published. They dealt with it really directly and we all handed that out to all of our community kids in those communities that we were in. I also got to go to Cincinnati and see the programming that they did there. So it was very similar because these African studies, uh, African cultural organizations at that time were meeting internationally and we were able to put things together. Hey, how you doing at Leland? You wanna come on up here? We have a chair for you. And you don't know how much of a legend until she starts talking. <laughs> yeah, that's the crown and glory of the LA Rebellion is that I think uh, uh, today's kind of, I, I might put my foot in it, but it's our, our today's gender conflicts. We didn't have that. We tried to just seriously work if you look at Hiley's work, you look at Charles' work, these were young men who were 20 something thinking this way. You don't see, you don't see those kind of lyrics coming in on the 20 year olds now. Uh, loving the women are seen, Angela Davis's perspective of being in jail, Bush Mama, all these wonderful stories. Even mine is about an African wind goddess coming to the United States to see herself. I didn't use a black man, I used the sister to tell the story of our plight here. So I think that that's one of the things that's really quite unique about our work, and I, I'm quite proud of it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but the question, but the question was uh, how the environment when we first came there? Yeah, I mean, I was pumped up because I, I one, had just come from Vietnam. Uh, I, I was about three, four years from that. Um, the idea of really getting it on, but not militarily, was fun to me. Uh, I, I'm not, after I left war, I left the guns behind because I saw that they were senseless. Totally senseless. It doesn't mean, you shoot somebody, then you make a whole family mad at you. So how are you going to get the whole family? So it just increases the number of hate once you do the first shoot. So it doesn't make any sense to perpetuate the first shot. It really doesn't. And I don't care who pushes it. Otherwise, I don't have a gun. But I tell anybody with a gun, unless they snipe me, I can still kill their ass. Because a bullet is an agreed upon circumstance. That's the reason they shoot you so many times. You know, so humans don't die with just one lead bullet. You know, we're more powerful than that. So anyway, so that's part of the reason that I was hyped up. Uh, but I, it was very horrible. Uh, you know, uh, they were beating 
the governor sent the, the folks on the campus and you saw white kids, black kids, all folks just got hit, hit with batons. That was the campus um, around Kent State and those kinds of things were going on. So to be a student at that time was dangerous. You know, they were putting us in jail and everything. So you're being monitored by Hoover. Uh, the moment that we walked into the school, the, the, the whole student population was being monitored by the FBI. So no, it wasn't a fun place to be in that way. And we were also the first black kids and people of color that showed themselves up beyond what Charles and them were there during the time when all of that was really happening. And they were the reasons that we kind of had an opening because of Angela and Geronimo and all of those events made it possible for us to have the graduate advancement program, which I got in on, which was uh, involvement of the EOP program, which was uh, for undergrads and then they had it for graduates. And so we were a part of the graduate studies portion of that. And uh, all the plight that he had on getting money, it was possible for us to get money because of the plight that they had. You know, and then it was easier and easier for each of us that went on. And when I went to the campus, I'll show you how bad it was, is I looked for, uh, I was a philosophy major along with art, so I was saying, ah, there's eight stories of this research, and now I'm gonna be able to at least find one line of African philosophy, right? I don't even think they still have it. <laughs> so I went in there trying to find that, and they sent me, of all places, to the Jewish cultural portion of it, and I got to discover Uganda in a different way because there's a lot of deep study that was done by, by the Jewish culture there. And so I got, I always tell my friends that I, how did I find myself at first? It was in the Jewish library, I found. <laughs> because they were doing heavy research on the upper parts of Africa and uh, all the missionaries and the people's works that was done there. There was a lot about us there which was really pretty wonderful. But then you're hearing me from me also saying there, were, there was no African Studies Department. There was no Indian Studies Department. There was no Chicano Studies Department. There was no Women's Studies Department. All of that happened during our dark guard at the school. We were able to get all of those kinds of things. By the time we left, it became institutions that people just like a basically said, oh, third world film. We as students started it. The school didn't want it. We made it happen. So that's the kind of environment that we were on is with that. But let's pass it on to our wonderful goddess here. <laughs> Absolutely. I wanted to extend the question to you as well. Um, if you could describe the environment um, trying to create under such tumultuous circumstances. Um, this is Alila Sharon Larkin, everyone. Give her another round of applause. Well, by the time I got there, these powerful, I call them the Elliot Bunny Orisha, because these young brothers had prepared a way for us. So I'm at USC dreaming of making films, you know, about my people, and I had no idea that half an hour away, Charles and Ben and Mary Clark, they were already doing it. So I get there, and I'm just blown away by the films. You know, um, I and I, since I, I'll never forget, you know, um, Sister Girl, like she's pulling up the, help me with the names, you know, when she's pulling up, yeah, the, um, the earth and her, her, her natural tufted hair, like blowing in the wind, that's what I had dreamed of doing. And so to get there and see that people are already doing this, and then again, like, First time I saw a pillar of sheep and to show me that's okay. I mean I remember us seeing that in to show me class and to see, you know, my life experience, my parents, you know, working class black folks on the screen like that, it was like it was again a spiritual experience. But I think what is so amazing is that, and someone needs to tell the story of these brothers. Like the first time I saw him, and Happy Father's Day, Happy Father's Day, um, the first time I saw him, in addition to seeing his wonderful work, is he was a new dad. 
he had a baby. <laughs> he had a, 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 his daughter, Dar, and I always loved her name, um, Dar and Snuggly. You know, downstairs in the big old <laughs> section. And you had to wait about, but you're so busy. <laughs> he was so busy shooting our films. And um, just like whatever these black men, these young black men, and you guys had to be like you were in your early thirties. Because like you got nine years in me. And you're even younger. So I I was twenty-two. And um, these young black men provided such a nurturing, inspirational environment, whatever, like they were egging us on to do things. So I had no idea what I was getting into. Okay, and um, like whatever you wanted to do, is they're going to to do it. So it was no, what was different was there was no competition. And, you know, it was none of that kind of energy. It was no hierarchy. Because people like Julie came there, like, she should have been teaching. Like, she had grown up in film. She had been a lot. You know, so she gets there in a program where she's already studied all of that. You know, so they didn't even know how to honor her. You know, but even with people coming with all this different um, knowledge and all these different skills, everyone was treated the same. And that kind of spoiled me, but like after um, UCLA, because it ain't that way. <laughs> I mean, it, it was from. So I didn't have the kind of, I didn't go through what they went through because they hadn't made a way for me. So my, um, I didn't even really deal with the other outside film department because it was like I was in my own black film department. And Larry Clark told me, you know, take me to the classes as few as possible, he said, just learn by um, working on the film. So I didn't take outside the camera and um, some other things that were required, they taught me. So like, on my um, on the tuition back to you, we co-edited the film. So he was my editing teacher. You know, so that was my experience. And I even feel now that when it's taken 40 years for my, my film to an image to get screened because basically we're censored filmmakers like um, Charles has snuck in a little bit, me and Julie, but you haven't seen Casting Proof, you haven't seen all these like masterpieces, you're not seeing Ben's film. So, because again, people died in the so called reckoning, all of a sudden, you know, and because of the technology, now you can actually see our films. That is the question. <laughs> um, I'm curious on your thoughts on this as well. Thank you. Um, I I uh, I came to UCLA in, in, in the '60s, and uh, there was few people of color there when I was there, and so it was really strange because, I mean, when we saw each other on campus, you know, we, there was this an instant camaraderie, uh, this c c connection. Um, like, I, I don't remember what, what the percentage of people of color on campus was, but I remember that if we saw a black person, I mean, it was like this immediate, like, you know, relationship, you know, formed. I, if we saw a shadow, you know, someone under a tree and it looked dark, you know, we, we were happy to see that, you know. It was like, yeah, but, you know, and, and uh, so it was, it was just really a nice experience being there. Um, I mean, it's changed now. I mean, I walked on campus uh, lately and people don't even speak to you, you know, things like that. You know, I was really disappointed. But, but then, I mean, everyone stopped and spoke to you and, you know, and, 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 and you know. Uh, uh, but, yeah, I was there when um, they had a lot of, when it was a very calm campus, you know, when, when everyone was in the flower of children and stuff like the hippie and stuff like that, you know, and nudity and all this kind of crazy stuff. And, but, but the people in, of, of color were taking filmmaking seriously because it, they felt responsible had, having to represent their community and their narrative, you know. And so we took it differently. Um, and uh, I, uh, you know, at the time it was right after the Civil Rights Movement, you had, you know, the Panthers, you had us, you had, 
you know, a whole bunch of other organizations that were really political at the time. And, um, you know, Angela Davis was trying to, to get a job on campus. She was in San Diego. Uh, uh, in San Diego, and, uh, and, and what was really interesting was that we had these international students there, particularly the French students who had been at the Sorbonne, and it, it were uh, these riots there, and they were kicked out, and they came to UCLA. And so there was this sort of like, uh, this energy created by them because it was a, a, a more of a radical kind of a thing that was, that was encroaching upon you know, UCLA's like, you know, it, it, UCLA is, is located right in the middle of one of the richest parts of this country, like Bel Air, Westwood, and, and Brentwood, you know. And the funny thing was that a lot of the, the students there who were very active, a lot of the white students, because there weren't many people of color there, who lived up in Brentwood and everything, and they would come down and, and, and be a part of this radical activity on the campus and they go back up to the hills, you know, and be, you know, these well-to-do uh, you know, rich kids. And I remember when there was this, a strike on campus, you know, and, uh, and they wanted me to get involved in it. And I'm saying, look, you know, when the police come, I'm the one who's going to get hit in the head with this club, not you. So, you know, I knew, I knew my participation in that was very limited. But, but anyway, but it was this, it was this time when you had these choices, and you had the Black Student Union, the Campbell Hall. How many? How many of you know UCLA? Okay, you, you, you but you know uh, uh, Campbell Hall, right? Okay. Well, I mean that used to be where the Student Union was, and that's where the Panthers and us shared uh, the building among other students as well, and and, and that's where they had the shootout and stuff like that at the, the, the Campbell Hall. I, anyway, um, uh, it was. Uh, uh, really a great time to be there, to get engaged and be involved in what was, you know, it's either part of the problem or part of the solution, you know, and Angela Davis uh, was trying to, to get a job at UCLA at the time, you know, and I remember working with these French students there who were doing documentaries, two of them doing a documentary on Angela Davis, so we shot a documentary on Angela Davis, and there was, I don't know if you know this, this young man who was killed, he just got out of Vietnam, his, his name was Amy, you know, he was playing with this, there was a young man who was a Vietnam uh, uh, soldier who came home on leave and he was playing with his, his, with his, with his uh, cousin or something like that in the front yard with a toy gun and the police came, came up and, and just shot him because uh, he thought the gun was real or some, some ridiculous thing. So we were all at, the, at, at his funeral, Angela Davis and George Jackson's uh, sister. Um, and, uh, and we were shooting, interviewing her, and, uh, and it was, um, oh God, it was this uh, thing where, where they didn't want her to have the job, you know, because she was supposedly a communist and things like that, you know. But everyone, was, everyone who was involved in politics wanted to use her, you know, to, for their cause and everything. So she was pushed here and there and so forth. And um, anyway, it, it was in Geronimo Pratt, uh, had just got out of, of the army. You know who Geronimo, Geronimo Pratt is, right? Oh, Geronimo Pratt. Uh, he, um, he, was, um, he was in prison for, God, I don't know, 20 years, something like that, after, after this, after the shooting, because he was involved in the shooting at, at UCLA campus in a way where uh, he was a member of the, he led the Panthers here in Los Angeles when they had the shootout. He was the one who made the Panthers, uh, because he had uh, uh, military experience, uh, made him fortify the Panther headquarters here and saved a lot of those lives because of the, the sandbags, knee, I know, four foot high, whatever it is. Anyway, so um, uh, he, uh, his sister was head of this program at UCLA that got students in um, to, 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 and into UCLA. It was a, really a, a great period of time when, when, when you can get into UCLA indirectly through uh, this particular aid program she had. Anyway, so she brought a lot of students in, in there anyway. And, and Geronimo wasn't a member of, 
UCLA, uh, wasn't a student at UCLA, but he, because he was a member of the Panthers, he was there at the, at the Campbell Hall and, and also with us group where, where they, were, they were feuding who, who were going to be the ones who controlled Los Angeles and UCLA. And, and, and Elaine Brown was there. And, and that's, and, and, and uh, God, I can't think of that, uh, Huggins, one of the Huggins. Uh, yeah, and, um, and so anyway, there was a fight broke out and, uh, and two people were killed. Uh, Erica, I mean, Huggins, I can't remember his first name, was killed. Yep, yeah, yeah. And um, anyway, to make a long story short, um, it was it was it was a uh, very complicated thing because some of the people who were involved in it were supposedly uh, working with the the, the uh, FBI and things like that, you know. So it's it's kind of murky. And, and John Pratt finally got out of jail uh, a couple of years ago, and he moved to Africa, and he died in Africa and, and things like that. But it was that kind of an environment where where people were getting involved in you know, off campus politics and things like that, you know, and uh, so it was, uh, I wasn't there because the film department is like north of where Campbell Hall is. And us filmmakers, we spent all our time in the film department. So we were kind of like, we were kind of like unaware of sometimes what was going on in, in, in the Campbell Hall and things like that, which is, you know, a, a, like a hundred yards south of the film department. But it was a, it was that kind of a time when Young people were engaged and involved. I mean, you know, uh, in, in politics and so forth. And it wasn't until, you know, a person like L. C. L. Taylor, who was a black teacher, first black teacher, I think, came to UCLA and introduced film and social change, third world cinema, and things like that, which gave us a sense of direction of what films we, how we should be making films. You know, political films, films that it's about, you know, our experience and and, and so forth, and. Uh, so it was like it was something like that, but but really, it, it was a great place to be, I think, and time to be. Yeah. Well, I could talk to you guys all day. Um, I have three pages of questions, but I just wanted to open it up to the audience and see if there's anyone here that wants to ask these legends a question. Uh, in your film, I noticed some uh, shot similarities to Black Girl from uh, Sinbad. Uh, also at I don't know if there was an international uh, kind of like inspiration there from for your film as well. I'm sorry, you said about in Silver Black Girl. Sibet. He some scenes that are like what, what, that reminded him of uh, Black Girl. I'm sorry, but directed uh, Black Girl and uh, Black. Black. So, right, as well. mm -hmm. so I don't know if there was any international inspiration there for your film. And the, uh, you mean like impact or influence from from Osman Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. Not really. Um, it, it, it wasn't until after when LSL Taylor brought, in fact, he brought Osman Sinbin to UCLA. For, he brought a lot of African film makers and films to UCLA at the time. Before that, it wasn't, it was all European films, you know. And it wasn't until Willie, actually, it wasn't until a person by the name of Willie Bell, who was a student at UCLA, uh, who had grew up in, in the South or someplace, you know, he brought in, you know, uh, black films like, uh, uh, um, Oscar Michaud and people like that, Spencer Williams and so forth. And, I, it was like, and it was the first time they had a black film festival on campus. And, and he featured all those, you know, um, films by Oscar Michaud and Spencer Williams, all these people, you know, and so forth. And it, it wasn't until we had, you know, people of color who, who created this, this, this mass, you know, that made these demands, you know. And uh, so it was, I mean, uh, we, we helped to change the university in many ways, you know. Uh, but no, uh, I met Simbin years later. Yeah, I think you'll find that in a lot of the, our works that you'll find a crossover feeling because when you're, we're being ourself, there is a similarity on how blues shows itself, you know. So I think that that gets fed out in a lot of our work uh, where you're being yourself and it seems like reflections you see in other African people, that happens a whole lot with our work, because I know that happened with even white folks that copy blues and jazz methodologies said, well, 
that one was happening first because, but they didn't know that this was stuff that bubbled up in this already. But, and other people saw that and then reflected it back like Elvis Presley, you know. Who has a biopic coming out? <laughs> How do you feel about that? Yeah, he does. Yeah, well, I'm just like, uh, what was the brother saying? Uh, who, who had no eyes, but he could see, uh, is uh, Ray Charles. He's, <laughs> cause he just said, you know, I, we were around a whole lot of kids that could do that, but it was just that he was white that it became famous, you know? And he ain't no, he ain't no rock and roll famous person except for America, like they discovered this place. They do mention appropriation though in the, um, in the new movie, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I think that that's what Hollywood is and that's the reason we, we left it. Uh, uh, it. And for my history, I was raised with a grandfather that projected all those movies and I wanted to do just the opposite. Yeah, I, so I didn't want to have talking heads because they were boring if you watched the same movie all day. You know, there was, it wasn't like listening to a song all day. It was like listening to this one head saying the same thing over and over. So I, I got tired of narrative in the Hollywood sense because I was raised around it all the time. One more? We have room for one more. I find, find it interesting, you had mentioned earlier, um, how we're just now able to see a lot of your films. Well, not a lot. <laughs> yeah, some. some. Uh, <laughs> Yes, bless them. Yeah, they yeah. show they the Lord's work because you can sit and watch. Yeah, that was rare. because yeah. we're really invisible in LA. Yeah. <laughs> and and I thought it was really I think and it, maybe it's because I'm here and like I see all these things happening recently and like there's a large effort, at least with my peers, to try and find ways to show your work, share your work. Um, you know, my introduction to you on the last few years. Matter of fact, art practice was that intro for me. <laughs> Um, but I'm curious for y'all now that you're seeing like that starting to bubble, you know, I think there's something special you just said earlier. I think there's something special about the way you challenge convention, and I'm hoping that now as there's more tools, more of us have access to even make films, that as we're exploring these things, we're finding y'all's work um, and work that that is born from that, too inspired by. Do you feel like, especially to Mr. Caldwell, you have this space and like cultivating education, and you, know, you all have screened your things in communities. Like, do you feel that reception? Do you feel like there's that groundwork is, is, is being, the, the work that y'all put down is being picked up, is being carried? Um, are you seeing that? Are you feeling that? The biggest lesson that I've learned is that, okay, we can make films, and even, it's even easier now for you all to do films, make films. But half of it that I didn't deal with at all was getting our films out to people, um, you know, reaching our audience and so forth. So that's what I'm dedicated to doing right now because we are able to do that. And I would say, as you guys make your films, you need to take care of that too. Like now, um, okay, now my film, A Different Image, is streaming on Criterion, y'all, so please. Um, it's nine dollars. Is it nine something a month? Yeah, you know. Oh, they it went up. Okay, because they had a special where it was nine something. But also um, now you can have your own channel. So I have a channel, you know, with my children's work. So please, like that's it's a Vimeo channel, and it's um, um, Dreadlocks and the Three Bears TV. D3B TV, and so like you can go and you su can subscribe on on Vimeo, and that's $9.99 a month. But um, we have to look at that differently. At I look at my channel differently. We we have to create new ways of um, showing our work and not copy what's out there, because again, as I work with my film daughter Kim Gathers, and I work across you know the generations. Um, you know, like she's saying, well, like for YouTube to have a YouTube channel, you have to have new content and so forth. And what I'm saying, like for us, I see my channel as like a living archive or a living collection. And so you have access to that. You can have grassroots access to that. 
And it's also a way to support our work. And so like another, and this is for you guys too, another filmmaker, Nadine Patterson, who's um, out of Philly, she's with Sisters in Film and Television. She was saying as artists, if you have a thousand um, fans or supporters and they donate a hundred dollars a year, that can sustain you to do your work, to have some kind of basis to do your work. So we have to think of things like that. And you guys have to think of things like that too, because again, it's like 40 years, like I'm really happy that now you can stream a, dim, a different image. And it just, I'm in, I, it's like, I'm still in shock about it. But um, 40 years is a long time, you know, to wait for that to happen. And we have to think of ways to make that happen now and you guys have to think of ways to make it happen now so like what i'm doing like with my um with my children's channel is i'm looking for a hundred friends you know to donate a hundred dollars a year and that will help sustain the channel and help kim run the channel and pay kim because millennials and gen x people cannot work for free we worked for free for each other you guys can't do that. And so like, I always try to give somebody an honorarium or whatever, because you can't do it. You know, um, I had no debt from college or even from going to UCLA. Like, you know, I didn't have any debt. And we could get a place to live when we were in film school. You could get an apartment without a job. Okay, like you just, we put down work study job, student, and you could get an apartment. <laughs> It's not like that anymore, you know? So, um, yeah, I think you really have to think about your audience and developing your audience. And um, you guys know how to, you know, you have your phones and people can pay you on your phones and all that kind of stuff. So you know what to do. Anyone else? Charles, Ben, we'll, we'll wrap it up if not. Yeah. I, um, my perspective has been, uh, was just after I got my degree in film, I took, just as I was about to graduate, I took Hugh Grau's class, which was on business. Um, and I did an internship with Peter Guber um, while he was the vice president of Columbia Pictures. And the real epiphany for me was that with the license of UCLA, I could go to all of those vice president office and listen. <laughs> so I did that. So I did a year with Peter Goober. I did uh, six months with the vice president of Capitol Records and watch him brag about this is the house that Nat built. <laughs> he called that wonderful cake looking place the house that Nat built because he's, he's still bringing in money. Uh, from all of Latin America. Uh, his works are selling even higher now because Latin people really liked his music. So they were bragging about that and letting us know that he was singing for them, not us, uh, which I thought was really interesting that you could tell me in my face that, but, but I listened. <laughs> um, the, and then I went to, um, uh, what was the independent company for distribution and I went there to get interest. But so what I ended up seeing is that the industry wasn't made for us at all. So I started this place as a way to distribute my works, but the way I distributed them is scarcity. So because it wasn't out there, I got more money. Because if it was out there, I only got $38. So it didn't make any sense for me to just get distribution with $38 every hit when I could build a deal up and have four screenings a year or four screenings a month where I could get at least $1,200 for speaking and, and $50 for the film. So that was my business plan from then on. <laughs> you said it was your plan? My business plan Okay. on how to stay alive. Is it happening? It kept me alive up to now. See, the rest of us didn't do that. 
<laughs> we didn't know. <laughs> well, that was how I had to do this in order to pay for my place. I had to have a fund, and I had to get funds somehow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I was raised around my grandfather, who did film distribution, you know, who did his distribution and ran his own club, his cafes and stuff like that. So I just did that kind of thinking on how to utilize my skills because I saw that scarcity and I also made, like I got to deal with, uh, with the libraries all of the East Coast and they were going to give me zero. And it didn't make any sense to get my name known just because it was going to be shown with roots because they were going to show it with roots and give me no money. I was like, fuck no. I was like, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, and so there are those kinds of deals that I got. And so, and then when I saw the deals that all of these Hollywood stars were getting was fee for service, which is the same kind of projects that we were getting, where you didn't get the upfront money. They got a $22 million, but not in their bank. It, they had to turn in each time they finish a package, they got money. And I think that that's the problem that I see now with all the folks that are getting Netflix deals and Hulu deals. They're doing the same game with y'all guys. So I don't think it's any better. You guys are getting played too. You know what I'm saying? They're giving up all their stuff. What deal do you got? I got Netflix. They were saying Columbia Pictures. Then. They were saying, you know, Universal Pictures. Same deals, same game, new generation. So all of that new generation is getting played because you have all the power in your hands, just like Alili was saying. You have the whole distribution and you're giving it up? That's stupid. Plain and simply inane stupidity. When you own all this creative juices and you have this much history to show how much this is worth and you're gonna give it up just for nothing. It's just like giving up your house that your parents built for, they got it for $40,000 just because it's worth a million, you're gonna sell it and get a million dollars when it costs almost a million to live in about five years here, paying $3,000 a month for rent. So uh, that's the way I feel about the new generation. I teach here and I'm trying to wake you guys up because the same game is being played with different names. And you have the power too. Just like the LA Rebellion, we showed you can go off grid. So what they don't know is here. Because, I mean, this place doesn't like anything except in nameness. So do we want to do butt service movies where we have our sisters shaking their butts in order to get our funds? I didn't want to do this. You know, we all didn't want to go that way because we could have. You know, so and I don't think that that's a good way for our because I'm monitoring all these new systems and we're not selling ourselves too well. You know. And I'm not seeing no extra quality work being done. I just see more in name, just releasing our energy, but not with a focused sense of how we're saying we're creatives, but I'm not seeing the creatives really doing creatives other than just trying to get numbers, you know, of how many hits and how many of this and stuff like that. And I'm on those platforms and I love them, but I don't think they're properly being used, you know. The other thing is that we don't have a BET and we should in that streaming platform in that world. And we shouldn't do what BET did is, is to sell out to, to Playboy. Yeah. So that's the other thing. All these guys, I did money studies with them. Each time they start making money, they sell themselves out when that's our cultural wealth they're selling. It isn't just belong to them. It belongs to all of us. And, and they're monetizing our goal and we're allowing it, you know. So those are the things that I feel about it. <laughs> Give it up for the LA Rebellion.